Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Rob Farris. I'm the research director at the Berkman Center, and I'm thrilled to introduce my friend and colleague, Ellery Biddle. Um, Ellery is an author. She is an editor. She is a policy wonk. She is the advocacy director at Global Voices, uh, which you all should know about. If you don't, go check it out, Global Voices. She's also a fellow at the Berkman Center. Um, she uh, is um, a person who straddles that interesting area between research and advocacy in a wonderful way. Um, she has been involved in studying and understanding uh, digital spaces in Cuba for a long, long time. And I myself have been watching Ellery watch Cuba for a long time. Uh, when, <laughs> when, when, uh, not in a creepy, stalky kind of way. So, uh, when, we, uh, when we launched our internet project several years ago, the first thing out the door was a paper by Ellery on Cuba, which we are thrilled with. So that's what I mean in that sense. Um, so uh, Ellery is going to talk about um, the internet in Cuba. If you're here to talk about sanctions and opening up uh, relations and those kinds of things, you're probably in the wrong place. We're trying to focus this on internet -y related issues. Is that fair? That's fair. Um, and so Ellery is going to talk for 20 or 30 minutes, uh, so we'll have plenty of time for questioning. Um, this is being live streamed, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. yes, so be careful what you say. Uh, it'll be recorded in uh, posterity. And uh, if you want to tweet about it, you could use the Berkman hashtag. Uh, and I think that's all I need to say. The floor is yours. Thank Thanks you, Ellery. So. Um, cool. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Berkman and Carrie, especially for pushing me to actually make this happen. Um, so I'm... I have been traveling to Cuba since 2004 and doing different things there as a student and as a researcher. And I took my most recent trip just last month. And I am overwhelmed by the amount of information and new things that I have to think about and talk about. So this is not like the definitive um, everything you need to know about the internet in Cuba. It's a tasting menu of stuff that seems important and worth further research, investigation, and discussion. Um, so here are the four, you know, the sort of listicle as suggested by Hassett. Um, here are the four things that I, I want to organize this around. Um, a little internet can go a long way. Everyone is a hacker. Everything is in the clear. And the US is not going to bring Cuba online. Um, so a little internet can go a long way. See, there's the, the Google dinosaur that you, know, um, you see when you can't get what you want from Chrome. Um, the internet in Cuba is still pretty slow. Uh, timeouts are frequent. The network often falters or fails. It is not omnipresent. Um, most traffic seems to pass through a proxy where it may be stopped, examined, or um, sort of messed with in some other way. But I, that is about all I know on the side of sort of technical um, control. What I have become more interested in what is what people are doing with the technology that they have. Um, generally speaking, there is not a lot of censorship. Um, scarcity of access is the thing that makes internet so tough in Cuba. So where does internet use happen? It happens in universities where people need access, places of work for professionals whose jobs seem to need or require an internet connection, internet cafes that are scarce and incredibly expensive, and Wi-Fi hotspots. The hotspots are something I spent, this is a relatively new thing. They've had them for about a year. There are lots of them. They are sort of widely available publicly. So you literally will be walking down the street and suddenly you'll see a bunch of people on phones somewhere. So you know there's a spot. Um, and that is, it's a big improvement over what the situation was. just a couple more. 
Um, but as you can see, it's not, it's great to be able to use the internet and to be able to move through the city and find one spot or another, but there are a lot of things that make this a pretty imperfect situation. Um, again, the timeouts and the cuts are constant. Also, weather is a factor. Um, this is a nice one because there's a, like a roof thing, so if it's raining, you just go in, under there. Um, publicness is a factor. You don't really have privacy, sort of personal privacy while you're online talking to someone, uh, doing research, looking something up. Um, also security, literal security is a factor. If you, you will see people holding computers, like, you know, with a laptop in a space like this, but that feels, to me, that feels a little bit risky. I don't like to take my computer out in a public space. Um, almost nobody has an internet connection at home. It's, it's a very rare thing, and to get one, there's a lot of, um, there's a whole process that you need to go through for applying for connection. Interestingly, people who do have home connections have started using extenders. So you occasionally will be walking down the street and you'll see somebody just sort of like next to a person's gate, like using their phone. And it's there, you know, there's, so there's a signal coming from there. And they're, they, you know, maybe it's somebody that they know and they've given them the permission, whatever. It's kind of interesting. Um, everyone is a hacker, so I hope this photo makes you all happy. It's like the thing that everybody wants to dream about when they think about Cuba, the revolution, and the old American cars. The old American cars are lovely to look at. They're also incredibly useful because they're, they're collective taxis, um, many of them, not all, but a lot of them, they work on a set route, and so if you are trying to get somewhere and you see one come by, you just shout where you're going, and if the driver is going on that route, and has space, he'll stop, you jump in. Great. The thing about these cars is that, so they're called almendrones. And the word almendron means big almond. And when you ask, if you ask people like, why are they called that? They're like, well, because it looks like an almond. Like, does it really look like an almond? I don't know. But I have always taken it to mean, I, I, I like the meaning because the, there's something nut-like about them and that they're, it's a shell. Like this is, look, it has the body of the old American car. I don't know which one that is, but um, inside you will find parts from Russia, parts from China, parts from like somebody's kitchen. Like, you know, there will, like the, the floor, of, I've seen a bunch of, been in a bunch of cars where the floor is literally like a piece of plywood. So the, the way that people keep these up and maintain them is very, there's a very open sourcey hacker-ish sensibility about keeping the things running. Oh, and this is just a guy uh, fixing one. So actually my favorite experience in my recent trip involving the Almendrones was I went, um, I went out to the beach and the, the ones that go out to the beach is a, it's a long, longer trip and so I was, when I was coming back, I was in a 55 Chevy that had like attached kind of above the rear view mirror was an MP5 player. And we just like watched Rihanna videos for the whole trip, <laughs> which seems kind of crazy because you're in this car that was built in the 1950s. You're in Cuba, which is supposedly frozen in time. Not true. Um, and you're watching these videos on like a pretty high quality device. They're not being streamed from somewhere. They're not being, you know, they're, they're not in a cache. The driver went and bought the videos. They're on a drive. He stuck them in the thing, and then we got to watch them. So it's sort of a cheesy metaphor, I know, but it's, I kind of couldn't, I couldn't resist. Um, so with a little, a little bit of internet goes a long way, right? Everybody who has a connection is not just going online and doing stuff and then leaving. They're going online getting stuff and then sharing it in other ways. Maybe sharing it, maybe selling it. Um, there is a lot of media that travels around on drives, on disks, and um, much more common now is to see signs like this. Places where, like this is just like we copy shows, movies, series, telenovelas, whatever. Um, and you can buy, there, so there's, there's like loads of stores now, and these are totally legal and authorized, and you can, you can get all kinds of pirated, um, for the most part, 
media in these shops, and you can also buy mobile phone apps. You're not going to the Play Store, you're actually literally physically going to an app store, and you hand your phone to the guy, and you say what you want, and then he plugs it into a thing, you hope for the best, and then you get some apps, and there's um, Open street maps is really popular. There's like several kind of um, just static information apps with different uh, different kinds of you know sort of directions and um, information. Like there's sort of a phone book app. Um, there's WikiDroid is pretty popular, so you can pick you can go get a static version of Wikipedia that you just have in your mobile. Um, also apps like Zapia are common, and you know any anything that functions on a on a Bluetooth connection or that uses some kind of connection that doesn't depend on um, uh, you know, a, a 3G network are also super common. I had the great pleasure of attending CubaConf, which was the first free software conference in Cuba, um, and got to know people involved with some of these projects. This, so the, the open source and free software development and commu community in Cuba is a really wonderful, neat group of people. It's nothing new there. It, this is a place, Cuba, the first connection to the global internet in Cuba was established in 1996. So there, for a long time, has been a community of people who are doing technical work and developing technical tools and software and products. Um, and I'll just talk about a couple that I found particularly interesting. One, I was kind of surprised I walked into a pre-event for the conference, and the first thing I saw was a big Mozilla poster. And I was like, oh, I, I know about that. <laughs> so I went and chatted with these guys. And there's a really, there's a nice uh, Mozilla community that is based in the Information Science University. And they do a lot of promotion of open source, and they also develop a lot of tools that are intended to help you with, deal with a, when you have a small amount of internet. So they, you know, they made an add-on called Disable Load Images, where you know, if you go to a news site that's sort of weighed down by images and video, et cetera, it just stops the site from loading that stuff so you can more quickly get text. Um, another one is called Download Plan, where if you you know, there's certain times a day where it's doing a big download is going to take a lot of time, so you can sort of set it up so it'll happen at a time that kind of works for you. Um, the other really interesting uh, group that I got to meet was some of the developers of Nova Linux. And so this is the Linux operating system that was developed in Cuba about 10 years ago and that most government ministries use. And it is free and open source. And the developers are an interesting group of people, and they said, you know, there's like a couple things. One, it, it would be, we could use some other open source software, but getting updates is actually really hard. And being able to set things up so that you can get updates easily through an intranet um, was a huge advantage. The other thing that they explained had to do with technological sovereignty. There is very little trust in closed technology and closed uh, source tools and platforms, particularly those that come from the US. We can all imagine why that might be. Um, so um, another interesting thing, I got to meet a couple of people who, who are involved in this project um, at the conference. So it's the SNET. Turn your attention away from the car and up to the cables and the wires up there. Some of those are telephone wires, and some of them are cables for the street net. The street net is a network that connects several thousand computers some, uh, with a combination of cable and wireless technology um, that has existed for about eight years in Havana. And like many uh, local community networks, it started out because a bunch of teenagers wanted to play video games <laughs> with each other. <laughs> And then they sort of got older and got interested in doing more stuff. More people got involved. Um, the SNET has two social media platforms. There's one of them, Sigame. Um, it has a couple of sites that sort of have a Craigslist-like function. 
There's VoIP. Um, there are some there's some streaming radio. There are a bunch of blogs with different kinds of information. Um, am I missing anything? Chat forums, uh, file sharing functions, stuff like that. It's a really nice user experience. I was sort of not, I wasn't sure what to expect in looking at it, but it actually, you, it feels very much like, you know, you click on Firefox, you go in, and you, you have an experience that feels very much like the experience of being a global internet um, with some obvious differences, but it is effectively an internet. So the SNET is cooperative. It's non-commercial, which is to say that there is, they actually don't, there are no, you can't have a service on there that is money making or that requires uh, money for you to use it. And it is self-sufficient and user driven. It's mo most of the, the little amount of funding that it requires for servers and for maintaining infrastructure is through donations for the most part. Um, the SNET is not secret. There, I was sort of alarmed at one point in looking, there were all of these articles in sort of the US tech media, the Mashable kind of um, websites that had headlines like, Cuban teenagers built a secret internet. And it's like, well, if it's in Mashable, how is that a secret? <laughs> um, it's not secret. It's not explicitly prohibited. Um, it's not explicitly permitted either. So it exists in this kind of gray zone. And there's been some talk lately um, by, um, uh, among some state actors about trying to come up with some kind of authorization for it. But for now, they remain in this territory. The SNET is not connected to the global internet. And that's important. The, I think, my sense is that everybody knows that if somebody were to connect it to the global internet, that could be problematic. Um, it, you cannot set up an internet connection without authorization. So they have decided not to do that. The other thing that I, I think is really true and important to point out is that it's not being used to plan social, now, social movements. That could happen at some point, but there is a, there's a strong norm um, to use it for other things. And there is actually, there's quite a lot of civic value in what's happening there, even if it's not, if it doesn't fall into that ambit. Um, okay, so third point. Everything is in the clear. There, there was really, being at this open software conference was really interesting because people were, there were several people from um, the US and from Germany who were asking over and over again about digital surveillance, digital surveillance. What are you guys using encryption? What kind of tools are you using? All of that kind of stuff. And the response usually is like, no. Um, and I was, you know, kind of trying to ask different people sort of what do they, how do they think about that stuff? What do they feel about it? And almost everybody that I talked to young, old people who are blogging or doing independent media projects and know what, you know, what options they might have. Um, journalists, including journalists from big international outlets who are working there as foreign correspondents, all of them said, we don't worry about it because we assume that what we're doing is you know, somehow seen. Um, when you go to the, so the Wi-Fi hotspots, the reason that I, I used this image is because I was sort of thinking about um, the, not only the experience of the sort of what might be seen technically, but also what might be seen physically. But so when you go to a hotspot, you can't just like log in or just be online. You first have to go to a kiosk of Etexa, which is the um, state telecommunications company, the only one. And you buy one of these cards. And to buy the card, you hand, you say how much time you want. And it's about $2 an hour. Um, and you hand over your money and your passport or your state ID. And the person working there takes that stuff, writes down some information from your ID, and then hands you back your ID and this card. And you, as you can see, you have this sort of annoyingly random login, equally annoyingly random password that you, you know, sort of scratch off. And then that becomes, that's actually how you get online. 
Every time you go onto the internet, you're logging in through the Nauta portal. Uh-oh, Chris Babbitts is locked out. <laughs> um, this is all like very, there's, uh, there isn't, I don't notice a lot of concern about this um, among people using the internet in Cuba because they're interested in using it and there is, like everywhere else, right, there's a general expectation that things are documented or recorded. Um, I'm actually going to skip that one. The other thing that I, that I sort of come back to this photo again, because I think that not only, there's something to be sort of thought about in the fact that people are outside most of the time when they're using the internet. And this, I was just doing some stuff on my phone one day and saw this group of these three women come to the park and they're all ta they, they were talking to somebody using emo probably. Um, and the conversation started out kind of lively and jovial, and then it got, something happened and it sounded like the tone changed, you know, it got serious. And just that kind of makes you realize how much you're, you just can't, you can't have an expectation of privacy in a social sense. And I think that that's, I think that's important. All right. Point four. I don't think the U.S. is going to bring Cuba online. And when I say the U.S., I mean the U.S. government, but I also mean U.S. companies and maybe even foundations or other entities that are interested in that idea. Um, there are two examples, there are two sort of interesting stories, short ones that I'll tell that have, I think, kind of helped to prove the point. The first is about this guy whose name is Alan Gross. Heads are nodding. Um, Alan Gross, when uh, the two countries announced that they were, you know, rekindling their relationship in 2014, for Alan Gross, that meant that he got to go home to Maryland after spending five years in a Cuban prison. Alan was put in prison because he had been working on a project as a subcontractor for USAID where he was taking um, satellite and Wi-Fi network equipment into Cuba without any kind of authorization. He was traveling there as a tourist. So he was erect, arrested and eventually convicted of acts that violated the integrity of the Cuban state. So he was sentenced to 15 years in prison, um, but then as part of the rekindling of the relationship between the two countries, he and one other um, American were released from prison and three Cubans were, so there was a prisoner swap as much as everybody wanted to say that it wasn't, that definitely is what happened. Um, I drew this cartoon and, <laughs> um, and it's, so that's like Hillary Clinton sort of, and that's sort of Raul and the, the well, but the, the point of the cartoon, right, is that Throughout the period of Alan Gross's trial, the State Department kept saying, listen, this isn't about us trying to undermine the integrity of the Cuban state. It's not subversion. It's just trying to bring internet to ordinary people. And the Cuban side kind of kept saying, well, actually, it sort of is subversion. And I think that, in a way, both entities were correct. Um, you can't look at what happened with Alan Gross outside of the history of the relationship between these two countries where there have been attempts at intervention via paramilitary attacks, exploding cigars, brutal economic sanctions placed on Cuba by the United States, and programs to support dissident activity that are you know, to the tune of $20 million a year at certain points in time. So you can't look at that case and say, oh, it's just internet. It's very meaningful. And I don't, and I think that this, when this happened, it really sort of supported the idea that the internet isn't just this open, free place where anybody can do whatever they want, but that it is actually, as many high-level Cuban officials have often called it, an ideological battlefield, um, and one where the US was very interested in trying to push a specific agenda. Sorry. Um, so, my other example is um, a little lighter, 
and more recent. So this is an art space um, out in the outskirts of Havana, and it is the art space of a guy named Cacho, who is a very well-known Cuban artist, a uh, very firm supporter of the Communist Party, and a good friend of the government. And he has the space is beautiful. He's got a whole um, sort of a compound with some galleries and his studio. And in 2015, he, he has had an internet connection there for a while. And he decided to turn it into a hotspot and to invite people to come and use the internet for free, which was great. So a little over a year later, right around the time of President Obama's visit to Cuba, um, Google got involved. Look, you can see their logo right there. <laughs> um, so like for a while, we kept reading these stories like, oh, these Google executives are going to Cuba. They want to they wanna put down fiber. They want to create countrywide wireless. Like who knows, you know? Um, and what they ended up doing, I think they've made a lot of big proposals, and I don't know many details about them. Um, but what they ended up with is this, which is, a room in Cacho's studio where there are 20 Asus Chromebooks. And you can go there and wait in line for a while and um, get a number. And when it's your turn, you hand your state ID or your passport to a guy. And then you can sit and use the Chromebook for an hour. Um, it is a really nice internet connection. And that is great, but I think <laughs> It's a sort of, it's an interesting response to an effort to really go big. And I should also note that this place is not, um, it's, it's a pain to get there. If you live nearby, it's fine, but it's about 45 minutes from um, downtown. And, you know, it's like, it's an effort. Um, this is, so this is the area surrounding the center. And it makes it very clear if you want to use the network, you don't have to go do some kind of exchange or anything like that. The contraseña, the, the password for the network is right there. Do you guys understand what the, what the password says? Down with the blockade or down with the embargo. The embargo is still in place. It hasn't been lifted, just FYI. So, and then this um, Carlos Latuf cartoon. So I think it's super interesting that <laughs> Google there's like this Google flag at one end of the block, and then there's this really um, powerful image that tells you how to get onto the network. I don't know what kind of, I don't really know anything about how this was set up or what the relationship is now between Google and the Cuban government, but it is, it was so striking to see this because this is a place where you, there's very little advertising in Cuba in general. And what logos or branding you do see are almost always state brands. And so, and there's, I mean, aside from the old cars, and I didn't plan that, that was just there. Aside from the old cars, like you don't see US brands anywhere unless you go to this place. Um, so we're back to the dinosaur again. The, I wanted to just end with um, a couple of images. So I got to check out some, or sort of stumbled into some art about the internet that I thought was kind of, a, produced some fun reflections for me. So this is a cartoon, like kind of based on the Google dinosaur. And what the dinosaur, what the T-Rex is doing is biting through a fiber optic cable. See, this is fibra optica. So there's cable in Cuba that comes from Venezuela, and it was laid. They first announced that they would do this project in 2007. And then the cable was finally laid in 2011. And then it wasn't until 2013 that anybody really saw any evidence that there was stuff flowing through the cable. So the cable is this kind of idea um, that hasn't, it hasn't gone in the direction that, that I think people hoped for. Um, and then this is the last piece. This is also a piece of cable art. And it's literally a submarine made out of a cable. 
So <laughs> I, I liked it because I actually think it's sort of pretty, but it also evokes, um, you know, it, it kind of makes you think about military stuff. It makes you think about the state. And yet it's, there's something kind of calm about the image. And you can't see, there's actually sort of a satellite there. I'm not sure. I think it's, it didn't make it into the picture, unfortunately. But um, I also I liked the idea of ending with this because it encourages you to go deep. Um, I think, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a really, it's a complex landscape. It's not all about politics. It's not all about using technology for, with some kind of specific political end. Um, there's a lot of really civically valuable stuff that's happening there, and there's a lot of limitation that people are struggling with, and that's all important. So that's the story. Questions. Can I, can I lob one at you first? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I, I'd love to know what we know about um, what folks are actually doing online these days in Cuba. What what what, what oh, websites somebody are can't hear you. popular? Uh, is it on now? There we go. I was asking uh, what folks are doing online and uh, like what, what websites they might be visiting, other social network sites, uh, microblogging, those kinds of things. Facebook is really huge. Like I can't emphasize that enough and but it's I mean yeah social networking like connecting with people and if you have enough connection maybe doing some other stuff but being able to connect with people and figure out um, how to get stuff if you want to buy something that you can't just buy around you and this isn't I'm not talking about like using a credit card to buy something from the internet but rather Craigslist style there's a lot that you can, you can learn that something is available and figure out who to call and go get it. Um, and pe you know, people read news, too. There's, it's, I, you know, it's, it's not, I think it's like, what I found myself doing there was noticing, first of all, that so much of it is just about connection with other people, but then also, Personally, it's like, well, if you only have crummy internet for a little bit of the day, what do you do, and how do you change your habits? Um, Can you guess about penetration rates now? I think was... penetration rates are a crazy idea because, look, like if you, all right, like I have internet at work, so that means I have access maybe 40 hours a week. And then, but I give two of those hours to somebody else, or I give 10 of them to another person. And then, you know, with the, the stuff like the extenders and, you know, all these different ways that networks kind of exist, how do you tally that up? And I feel, I mean, I felt like using the SNET is a way better experience than trying to use a hot, one of the hotspots, because you don't, it doesn't cut out. You, you know, you chat, you do whatever. So I don't know. I refuse to answer. June. Oh, he's going to give you a. Um, I was curious about your statement that you didn't think that uh, Cuba would be internet accessed anytime soon. Um, and for a long time now, the universities mm -hmm. have had fairly good access. And when I correspond with Cuban academics, you don't really know if they're in the United States or Europe or Cuba. So I was wondering what you thought about the next step being businesses, um, in the sense that a lot of businesses like Airbnb mm -hmm. no. uh, to, to it depend on, on internet, mm -hmm. and whether perhaps there's going to be, rather than a blanket oh, we'll have internet, it'll go from universities to business, and then something else, and then something else, and then something else. It's hard to tell. I do want to clarify. It's not that I think access isn't going to continue to increase. I just don't think there's going to be some moment in which a US entity comes along and plunks it down. Um, there is talk about trying to bring broadband to people's homes, which is really encouraging. But 
talk is different from it happening. I mean, the cable, you know, it took a solid, what, six years from when talk started until it actually became active. So I don't know. I do think that the more, I mean, that the business angle is really important. Like the Airbnb story is interesting because Airbnb, when they opened their services to Cuba, sort of officially made sure they could legally do that as a US company, um, the number of Cuban places you could rent on Airbnb shot up in the first week. And the reason for that is that it's a place where for over 20 years, renting a room from someone has been a really, like as a tourist, has been a really common thing to do. So the structure was already there, but there was never, the way that you figured it out was just like, ask your friend and your friend's friend will take you to some place. And this kind of brought this new layer on top of it. Um, but I think that there, I, it'll be interesting to see what other examples develop in that way and that can sort of make a case for having better connections in more places because of the economic and social benefits that it brings. But I don't, I don't know what to expect. You. In a lot of the developing world, one of the first things that tends to take off, especially in low uh, bandwidth areas is digital currency, right? Like mm -hmm. the ability to do payments from person to person uh, without an intermediary of some kind, right? Like Bluetooth, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like that going on in Cuba I, at this point? I, I don't know. Okay. It would be interesting, but it there. is a place. There's two currencies, and that's a whole complicated yeah. topic. And generally speaking, people do not have credit cards, yeah. which is... That's also uh, right, which is also a characteristic. Yeah, a lot of places. Um, yeah. But I, I really don't know. Okay. Yeah. You. Oh, okay. You first, then you. Well, no, no. You, you have the mic, so you okay. should go ahead. Hold on, Herb. Okay. Um, is what you describe both in terms of internet and SNET, is that just Havana, or is it uniformly spread through the smaller cities and the countryside? You know, how, how much can you get to either internet or SNET? from out, other than in Havana? So SNET is in Havana, although it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's not just sort of the central part of the city. It's a fairly spread out. There are other local networks sim, that are similar in the way that they're set up in other parts of the country, but they're not connected. I don't believe so. Um, there's also the Isla de la Juventud, which is an island uh, about what, 60 miles south, I think? They actually have their own S-net that they call SS-net. <laughs> um, so there's, yeah, there's similar projects, but they're not all, they don't all, they don't talk to each other. And that's, if, if authorization were to happen, that could, I don't know what all that would bring, but there's some possibility. As far as internet, um, hotspots are throughout the country, but if you're in a rural area, it's not the same, you know? And I don't, and I ha and I don't know how different the connection might be either. Oh, you. Oh, wait, you. And then we'll go. Hi. And then. Hi. Um. So I also actually uh, went to Cuba in December. Um. And wasn't actually expecting to talk to people about internet access, but ended up spending most of my time talking to people about internet access because that's a thing mm -hmm. that people really want to talk to you about. Um. And I heard a, a lot of a lot of different anecdotes, um, and I'd love to talk later in a not Q&A session, but one thing that I heard from um, a lot of people is that prioritization is becoming an issue um, with the burgeoning tourist industry. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people feel like tourists are getting internet before um, people, and I'm kind of wondering, like, how is the tourist industry locked in with American companies coming and also American internet. Um, I met someone who is, uh, you know, working in the first fully connected um, hotel where you could actually get internet in your rooms. And she was mm -hmm. talking about how, um, you know, it feels like it's, it's kind of being kept from Cuban people and being catered to tourists. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, I think that the... Like when I first started, I first started going there in 2004. And at that time, there were a couple of internet centers where you could 
go and pay a bunch of money and give over your passport and do the whole thing. Or you could go to the hotels, and all of the hotels had like a nice place with a bunch of computers, and it was a relatively okay process. And I think that it, in a way, there was a lot that started there. Like it, earlier on, the feeling that oh, you, this is all you know available to tourists, but not to citizens, was much stronger, and that it is. It feels significantly better now, and now that, I mean, the economy, people do have more means than they did 10 years ago, so to spend the equivalent of $2 on an hour of internet is a lot for some people, but it's, it's reachable. Um, but I do think, I mean, I think that the, I wonder what will happen as, more, as there's more tourism from the United States. The fact is there's been a lot of tourism from other super developed industrialized countries for a long time and people just kind of manage. But I do think it's a drawback. And I, you know, I've noticed there have been a couple of big conferences that have happened. There was also a little big to do when Obama came to town and everybody said like, oh, the best thing about it was that the internet was suddenly good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so there's, a, there's like, there's a knowledge and, you know, expectation that you're gonna have to kind of make things better and that's, there's a, that's a double standard, you know, and it's something that the government has been dealing with since the 1990s when they brought in the U.S. dollar. It's just there are there are these sort of two standards that they maintain, but there's a cost to that. There's a political cost. I just want Wait. to pile back on that on that oh. because it it goes back to the age-old debate of whether the bandwidth scarcity is a policy choice by the government or it's, it's economic reality because of the blockade. Is there any update on that? What are people saying these days or is it still kind of murky? Um, it's always murky, but I think that the, look, the Obama administration made a lot, did a lot, has done a lot over the years to loosen up the restrictions. The, you know, there's various laws that fall under the umbrella of the embargo and the administration made a lot of effort to make it so that telecommunications companies could offer services, so that stuff could be built. Um, they also have this cable. The, look, the speed is way better than it used to be. Like, it is better. So that's great. But I don't, you know, I think that there's a, there's a feeling of we need to expand access, but we have to do it really carefully, and we need to we need the, you know, to be deliberate about it. Um, and there's, you know, things are centralized there and, and systems move slowly. So it's not, some of it surely has to do with concerns about um, communication and information circulating, but it's also an effect of how systems work. Thank you so much for such a fascinating presentation. Um, I have two clarifications I'm curious about. One is who pays for the Wi-Fi spots outside? And the second one, in that artist studio, when you use an internet for an hour, mm -hmm. is, there, do, is there identification of you or do you use it completely anonymously? Okay, so the first question is who pays for the, the public Wi-Fi hotspots? Those are, that's the government. That's, I mean, the Atexa, which is the telecommunications company, but that's, which is a state-owned company. It's not free. You're still paying for it, but yeah. Um, you buy the card and then, yeah. Let's see, for Cacho Space, what, how, you're asking how are you identified in, So what happens there is I don't actually know what kind of identifiers might be used technically, but you do, you are submitting your, your state ID and, and it, you don't get it back until you're done using a computer. Not Somebody? sure this is working anymore. Oh. Maybe this. 
Uh, uh, my question is for about uh, uh, the internet as a news distribution. Mm -hmm. There has been a phenomenon of news outlets coming up, like Catorce Medio, Ioni mm -hmm. Sanchez, and Perismo de Barrio. I wonder if uh, how do they operate, and and what's their public readership, their, their, their outreach? Do you see people talking about them? So good question, and something that I kind of wanted to cover, but it, I didn't, and now I feel bad. Um, <laughs> But so there are a bunch of interesting independent media groups, blogs, organizations that have been working there for a while. Um, some newer, some have been around for a long time. The way that they do a lot of their work is in analog in the sense that you're sitting in the room and passing a drive around to and talking together about what you're writing. And it's, it doesn't, I don't think that sounds very novel if you've ever worked in a newsroom or, <laughs> you know, but, that, but it is, it's a lot of the work that they're doing together. They're literally doing the same physical space. As far as distribution goes, it's a huge challenge because with, first of all, with the scarcity issue, the idea of like, oh, I'm going to go check out this news blog, like that's actually usually not people's top priority. Um, there's all of these different mechanisms for distribution, stuff getting around. There's the packet of the week that's like a giant bunch of media that you can buy on a drive, you know. Um, that doesn't usually include those kinds of independent media source materials. Um, so you circulate material by email. You can just sort of pass it out to people. But I think the dynamic still for those independent orgs is that much of their readership is outside of Cuba. And that's valuable too. But there's sort of, there's a, you kind of have to ask a question like, well, is, what is the, what's the value of doing independent media work for where you're actually trying to inform a community or public around you versus this sort of somebody outside, both are valuable, but, you, but, there's, but it is different. Um, all of them have distribution strategies, local distribution strategies, but I think that they're, I still think it is, it's, there are people who do tech stuff and who are in that community know about them and see the content, but I don't know how much further they get. So um, related to that is, would it be frowned upon to bring something like a giant library box with you with a ton of content and just turn it on with that? And have you done that? I haven't done that. No. I didn't, I, no. <laughs> I just went, I went with a what burner phone, that was all. But, well, no, no, but, but look, there are a lot of people who have stuff set up like that. So to go, I mean, I'm not, I can't tell you <laughs> definitively what is or isn't okay, but, um, Several years ago, I was there, and I went to this like salon thing held by this um, linguistics professor who travels a lot, has a big digital, digital archive just on his own computer of papers and articles and texts. And he put a list of everything that he had, like put these lists on the walls in his living room and invited all these students to come. And everybody just looked through and there's like a guy sitting at his computer and you just hand him a drive and you say, I want these articles and he sticks them on there. And that's, that's, a, that's a how stuff can move around. So similar kind of idea, um, but I can't tell you, you know, <laughs> how say it? Oh. And then Hi, uh, this is a great talk. Thanks so far. I have so many questions, but uh, I'm I'm curious specifically about StreetNet, and it's not secret, but it's also not explicitly permitted. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if the state has used StreetNet at all, has kind of, um, or state institutions have kind of used the StreetNet as, hey, it's here, let's use this. Mm -hmm. um, and also kind of the origin of the apps, the social networks mm -hmm. that are being used on there. Is that stuff that's been hacked together in universities, students, user groups from the early web there, or kind of how that came about? Um, great question. So has the government used StreetNet? Of course. I mean, Cuba, the, I think, and this is true anywhere, but there in particular, you know, still most jobs there are 
fall under some kind of a state institution. So to talk about the people as one thing and the government as another doesn't, it's easy to do that, and I know I do it colloquially too, but it's in reality there's, there's no sort of clear line there. So certainly people who are associated with the relevant ministries have looked at street man, for sure, I'm sure. And my guess is that they find it kind of, you know, kind of neat. <laughs> Um, the question of permission or authorization is like, I don't know, but I think that my, my guess is that it's, it's a kind of neat project and it has engaged a lot of young people in software development that, you know, that's not a bad thing. Um, where has this, who's developing the stuff? A lot of people, I mean, the various open source programming languages, super popular there. There's a lot of, there are libraries of those languages so you can get what you need to, um, to develop what you want to develop. So it's not, it's not, hmm? There's, well there's stuff, there are repositories, but you can also, you can access GitHub there. So it's not, it's, you know, they're not, it is, it's not, uh, it's not so cut off. Wait, did that get both parts of the question? Okay. Hasid, Hasid. Hi. Um, a lot of developing countries like to brag about the proliferation of mobile internet and smartphones. Um, what are the prospects in Cuba for the equivalent of 3G or 4G? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I, that I've heard less about than the idea of broadband in people's homes. It would, you know, it would take a lot of work and planning. I don't think that, you know, if some, if they did want to invite some U.S. or more likely Chinese company to come in and set that up, it could happen. But it's not. Um, I don't know. I should say though that it's, it's remarkable how much you can do with a mobile phone. Nate can talk about this a lot. Like it's remarkable how much you can do with a mobile phone that isn't attached to a 3G network. There's one thing I meant to talk about is um, there's a, a couple of different apps people have developed that let you use your national email, which you can get on your phone, um, where you can, you can send an email and it will, there's like a neat system that I don't understand the technology behind that will send a request to a website and then bring it back to you. So you can send a request to Wikipedia, you can send a request to, you know. So that's kind of, so there's a lot, there's sort of a lot in between stuff. Sebastian. No. In just wondering about StreetNet, I was and hearing about all the transfers that are happening on USB or alternate media that's not networked, I assume that they use StreetNet to transfer much of the same information. Or is there yeah. an understanding that stuff that's for sale in stores isn't to be transmitted freely within StreetNet? Um, wait, so plen yes, plenty of files that you might get because you physically went to get it, you could also get if you're connected to StreetNet. True. What was the second thing, though? Money-related thing? Well, many of these, you said that there's stores that sell them. Right. So is there, like, a, a pirate, piracy? Pirate, pirate, pirates? <laughs> Three-level pirates, I suppose? <laughs> you're for the service, not for a, a DRM license, right? You're yeah, yeah, no, when you're... Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's also should be noted that the shops where, I mean, I went and bought some, I don't know, a bunch of Cuban movies that are really hard to get here, and I paid 10 Cuban pesos for each one, which is like 40 cents, which is pretty good. Um, but yeah, it's almost a symbolic, you know, it's not a, but I, yeah, I think the whole question of what's going to happen with intellectual property if the countries really start to do more stuff together is huge. And I don't know the answer, um, but it is, I mean, the ideology of the Cuban revolution, the way that sh sharing and collective um, ownership and caring for things and maintaining things, 
that that is the norm there clashes a lot with our, with the United States ideas about and laws about intellectual property. And it's gonna to be tough, I think. Sarah. I just wanna, on root lob on top, that that's not unique to Cuba. I mean, no, people not at aren't all. buying much American content anywhere. Apart from true, 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 true. <laughs> this is a question about surveillance. Um, hmm. are, the, are the hot spots, do you, is there, are they being surveilled? Is there concern about that? And in general, is the attitude about surveillance, um, any, is, how is it different there than it might be here? Well, so you log, so you're always going through the Nauta portal whenever you're using the internet in a hotspot. So take that for what it's worth, but I would, yeah, I would assume so. Is there concern about it? I mean, probably, but I don't, but I, yes. But it's also an accepted condition, you know. It's it's um, there's a you know there are a lot of really heavy laws that restrict the use of encryption there. So it's not. Um, it was extremely uncommon to hear anybody say, "Oh yeah, like I'm you know using this special secure app." Like no, no. And I try. I mean, I was sort of trying to use stuff that I already have on my phone, and it was that uses end-to-end -end encryption. It was extremely difficult or if not impossible. Um, I think that's the best way to put it, that it is, that it's an accepted condition. And it is, again, not, it, there's nothing uniquely Cuban about that either. I do think that um, the, the thing of being accustomed to both this kind of physical surveillance and people just noticing each other and maybe taking note of things that they see and maybe using that information to some end later on is important in not only for sort of on its own, but as a component of the kind of full experience of being a human who moves around, who has conversations, who does stuff in the internet and elsewhere. Matthew. Oh. Uh -huh. uh, I think, I don't know actually. I like, I really don't know. Um, you basically can't use Tor. I mean, if you are really savvy, you can figure it out, but it's, first of all, it's incredibly slow, but I think there's also sort of ways that it is made difficult. I don't know what the technical sort of components are of that. And then other stuff is just really slow, and we should brainstorm later about why. I can tell, I can give you, later on, I can give you more information about the particulars of that experience. I actually, we should, well, we should talk about that later because there wasn't, I did not, right. Um, let's talk about it later. Okay. Hey, like, so I'll count how quickly you've been working. Um, but anyways, I was just curious, um, with the blocking of the secure connections, um, there's been this recent movement with the Snowden stuff uh, towards websites going to only, and so I was mm -hmm. wondering, does that then block the ability of Cubans to access those websites there? Or is the government allowing it, or is there sort of some roundabout way that they get in? Um, do people need to think about um, if they're a webmaster offering a non-HTTP secure if they want it available in Cuba? Mm, don't know. I think... Um, there are ways to get around, there, there are work, there's certainly workarounds. And there's a, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of certificate issues too that come into play there. But I don't, I, I, can't, I wasn't doing a whole lot of technical stuff there. And so I can't, we can talk more about it. Now, like, 
Washington Post is secure, mm -hmm. US government websites are secure. Facebook requires it. Oh, you just mean acts? Oh, I, so I was like, oh, so you, yeah. you can get, I mean, any, uh, there are plenty of HTTPS sites that you can access to. Oh, That's okay. not a, so yeah. They let you. Yeah. No, so there's uh, regulation of end-to-end -end encryption, like sent, you know, encrypted email and things like that. But you, no, 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 but going to, this is where, this is where it's like, we'll just, we'll lay it all out on the table later. Uh, but yeah, no, no, um, sorry. So yeah, so when you actually, when you go, um, I'm gonna like go through a bunch of these. Uh, when you go to the Nauta login page, you get, oh, there it is. Sorry, okay, when you go to the now to login page, it actually, you get a, a notification, <laughs> a notifi you get the notification that says, this certificate, or this doesn't have a trusted certificate. Attackers right. might be trying to steal your info, da 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 da. Right. You can't buy a certificate there. So there's that, or that has, the, there's, so there's like some kind of combination of legal and political and technical I, thing that has made it so that Nauta doesn't have one. Yeah. But Let's Encrypt actually may change that um, because it is a completely free and open source certificate authority that the um, some people who are working on Let's Encrypt actually were at the conference and there's quite a lot of movement around trying to get that established there. So that yeah. will change. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add as a comment, if you're seeing that certificate, it means that uh, it is possible that someone is man in the middling it, and it's possible mm -hmm. that their systems are. And if you want to get around like using certificates, or S if you want to use SSL sites outside of Cuba, if they have a proxy in the middle that's sort of breaking that, that encrypted communication. Sure, I mean, like I said, there's a generalized expectation of monitoring. So, you know, there's various ways in which that may be probably is happening. Should we, we need to wrap up. Should we collect a couple questions and then call it? Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Anything, like, different that anybody's? <laughs> We've heard from you already. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Not, I didn't say authentication, okay. authorization. So you need, and I'm, that's a state thing. You need state authorization to set up a connection to the global internet. Okay. That's very clearly laid out. But SN still has its own you know, login, logins and passwords and stuff? Or, or so yeah, you create an account, you actually, almost everybody is, uses a pseudonym of some kind, a handle. Um, it's the way that it's managed is kind of an interesting. Do you have one login for all of SNET, or do you have one for each application on SNET? You have one for all of it. Okay. So their thing that looks like a Facebook clone is just you. Is. You, you, you log into SNET, and it, it gives you access to that, and you use the same login there. Yeah. I mean, I. Yeah, okay. I guess. I actually, I don't want to, I don't want to like go too far into okay. that, but. Uh, okay. Uh, what were you? Thank you so much. Sure. This is wonderful.